Hey there, it's time for the show, the Tatiana Show, where you make friends and talk life and crypto. This episode of the Tatiana Show has been brought to you by eToro.com. You can trade in a wide range of assets, connect with the crypto community, and automatically copy top performing portfolios at eToro.com. Quite simply, they have the top currencies, smart tools, low fees, social trading, all in one simple app. They facilitate over $1 trillion in trading volume per year globally. eToro makes powerful trading tools easy. Get started in minutes right now at eToro.com. That's E-T-O-R-O.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Tatiana Show. I'm joined today with my co-host, Josh Shigala from Voltoro. Hi, Josh. How are you? Good, good, Tatiana. I'm fresh back from the UK. I was over there for Brexit, having Brexit during brec- Brexit, breakfast, something like that. And uh, yeah, it was uh, actually nothing changed. So I actually even tried to get back into the EU with my British passport and, uh, and it worked. So I don't know, nothing really changed. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad to hear that there are no changes with this thing that we've been forced to listen to on the airwaves for, I don't know, years now, it feels like. But anyway, so let's get down to the Tatiana Show, which has been brought to you by eToro. I just wanted to give them a shout out to the eToro team. Uh, they're doing lots of cool stuff where you're following people's trading habits. So maybe if you don't know anything, you could learn. But anyway, so I'm bringing on our guest, Jeff Dice from the Mises Institute. He's the president over there. He and I were on the Contra Krugman cruise. I think it was either last year or the year before. And he gave a lot of talks over there. He's, of course, been involved in the libertarian world for many years. So I'm really excited to have him on the show. He has a wealth of knowledge. I've got some questions prepared. I'm sure that you do as well. Uh, Maybe we can even get his thoughts on Brexit. So Jeff, thank you so much for making time to be on the Tatiana show today. Welcome. Good morning, Tatiana. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Great to have you here. So for people who are not familiar with your background, if you could take a few minutes to just give me and the audience a little bit of a evolution of Jeff Dice, what has happened? Because I know you were in the finance world for a while. You worked with Ron Paul, but people who are unfamiliar with your background, if you could give me a little bit of the story of your evolution into liberty. Oh, Tatiana, I I hope I'm still evolving, please. I need to evolve a little more. Basically, I met Ron Paul in 1988. I was an undergraduate in college, and he came to my town to Orange County, California, and spoke at a little Ramada Inn. And I had already been reading Reason Magazine because my older brother got it. That was a very early iteration of Reason Magazine in the 1980s. And fortunately, my father I think he had a copy of Road to Serfdom lying around the house, which I had picked up and read, and I'd read some Ayn Rand and that sort of thing. So all that sort of garden variety background. But really, I owe a lot to my brother because I think he was thinking along these lines pretty early on. So I was a young guy in my 20s and went and saw Ron Paul and uh, got more involved as a result of that. And, you know, I didn't really think all that much of it other than I had a political perspective that was perhaps not mainstream. It didn't uh, sit with me as some sort of overarching worldview or, you know, it's just kind of like, hey, my politics are a little weird. But other than that, I'm a I just went to law school because at the time in California, the uh, late, in late, well, I, at that point, early 1990s, starting to recognize that there was a, a PhD glut. And though I was, you know, maybe somewhat academic minded, I hope to be an English professor someday. I, I didn't want to have dim employment prospects. So I went to law school and figured that that would dovetail somewhat with my libertarian perspective if I worked on behalf of, let's say, criminal defendants or taxpayers or something like that. Uh, and so that's ultimately what I did and what I planned to do. I never planned to to work or have a career promoting Austrian economics or libertarian thought or anything like that. It's just something that happened organically after many, many years of being an attorney in private practice, private equity clients. Ron Paul called me up and I went to work in his office for a couple of years and then left again. But through Ron, I met Lou Rockwell, who is the founder and chairman of the Mises Institute and get, got to know him a little bit. So uh, again, return to this world, of, I guess about five or six years ago now, I've been here a while. So as a result of all that, my long suffering wife and family, we left, we'd, we'd always lived in expensive places. And so we left and went to Auburn, Alabama, which is home of the Mises Institute. And so now we are comfortably ensconced in the U.S. South and you know, really enjoying it. There are a lot of challenges. Obviously, it's a weird time in America. It's a weird time in the West. And are we winning? Are we gaining ground? Not, 
tough question, but you know, here I am and hoping to do my part. Awesome. Well, thank you for your contributions. I've got some overall questions for you about libertarianism and just what the future looks like for libertarian education. But can you just give us a breakdown of what exactly is the history of the Mises Institute and what they are doing actively in order to educate people about Austrian economics? We really got our start because Ludwig von Mises had all of his career hoped that there could be some sort of graduate institution in the United States that taught Austrian in thought and theory. And there really wasn't one. He suffered for many, many years in the wilderness in New York City at NYU and also at conferences and traveling around the world and speaking, realizing that as of about the 1930s, in most of Western academia, the Austrian perspective had been largely shunted to the side in exchange for Keynesian orthodoxy, which is still in sort of a neoliberal way is still true today, uh, you know, almost 100 years later. And so he really thought it it was important that the old masters from Vienna still have their day and still be heard from. And, and he tried in a couple different places, the University of Chicago for one, to create what he envisioned as a liberal institute. And he had some various financial backers, that sort of thing, and never quite got off the ground. So Lou Rockwell had an opportunity to, to edit some of Mises' books while he was still alive at a publisher called Arlington House, which was run by Neil McCaffrey. And as a result, got to meet Mises once or twice and got to know his widow, Margaret, quite well. And so when he passed away and there were some various organizations beginning in D.C., like the Cato Institute, Lou Rockwell and Murray Rothbard decided to create an institute along with Margaret von Mises that would promote not only Mises' work, but also the Austrian school and promote young people who were coming up in this tradition. So that was all a world ago in the 1980s. As you can imagine, in the pre-digital age, things were very, very different. So how you got information out there and disseminated thoughts and theory was very, very different. So fast forward 37, I guess, odd years, there's been a few different iterations. There was 1.0 Mises Institute in the analog world where we held conferences and mailed people newsletters and video cassettes, if anybody remembers those. And then 2.0 is really when we got online, which we were early, all things considered, in the 1990s with, with Mises.org. And I would say 3.0 is kind of where we are now, where we've got this incredibly scattered world of social media, 24-7 news, just an absolute blitz, a bombardment of white noise. And trying to cut through that and make sense of that is, is our challenge today. So that's, that's where we are. And we hope through some of the things we do, we reach at least those people who can be reached. And that's really the goal. What do you think of the current political climate? Because, you know, we've got Trump. Everybody's talking about Trump. How influenced do you think he is, is he? I mean, I think that the Trump campaign sort of hijacked a lot of Ron Paul people, but how influenced do you think he is by Ron Paul and furthermore, Austrian economics? So what do you think of that? I mean, he's obviously a little bit uh, hard to pin down, but what's your overall thought on that? I don't think he's very much influenced by either. I hate the political status quo in America. Honestly, I, I don't like living in a highly politicized world. I think a civilized, humane world would be far less political. I think politics is just a cheap substitute for war, and it's oftentimes a precursor to war. Yeah, he is. And so I don't think, I, I mean, you can trace Donald Trump back to, let's say, Pat Buchanan in a sense. And if you go back even earlier than that, if you look at Barry Goldwater, who ran in 1968 for presidency in the United States, he lost very badly. And a lot of people said, well, there goes that. That's the end of the Goldwater right movement. But you can trace, albeit circuitously, you can trace Goldwater's fans to Ronald Reagan's two overwhelming landmark elections in 1980 and 1984. So sometimes this stuff percolates for a while and comes back and, and takes shape and form in, in a different vehicle. And, and so I do think the Tea Party and the Ron Paul revolutions had something to do with Trump winning. I don't think they really had an ideological or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I don't think it was the ideology of the economics so much as a pushback. I mean, that's really the story of Trump. It's not about, the guy doesn't have an ideology. It's not about his so-called policies. It's not about the people he surrounds himself with. It is about the fact that that many Americans were willing to push back against 
the tried and true, what we knew was inevitable, which is that Hillary Clinton was going to be the next president of the United States. There was no question about it. And the idea that that many voters, 60 or 65 odd million of them were willing to go off the reservation and vote for this crazy reality talk show guy, I think speaks to how much Americans sense that something's wrong. It's deeply, deeply wrong. And, and, and Trump is not necessarily the answer to that. But just the fact that even as we're surrounded with at least ostensibly so much material wealth, people sense that something's very wrong. And so our task is to try to explain that without getting too technical and, you know, talking about inverted yield curves or something. But it's, you know, Trump's a symptom. He's not the disease. And I think a lot of libertarians really didn't understand the opportunity he presented because he essentially won as a third party candidate. I mean, he's basically Ross Perot. Yes, he had an R next to his name and that got him on the ballot in all 50 states. I, I understand that that's not so easy and that truly running as an independent or a third party is difficult. I understand technically that, but in, in every meaningful way, Donald Trump won the presidency as a third party candidate without without having any part of a GOP ground game whatsoever. And that represents a huge opportunity and we shouldn't sleep on it. Do you think that the Libertarian Party has even a place at all in the 2020 election season? And do you think that Trump is going to take it? Well, I hope it does. I'm a big fan of third parties. I was very active in the LP for a while in California in my youth. I've gotten away from that. I, I like the idea of third parties. I want them to upset the apple cart. I want them to injure the two parties. Uh, you know, Trump, you got to admit, Trump injured the Clintons. Trump injured the Bushes, and we owe him something for that alone. So I, I do want to see third parties prevail and succeed. I wish we had, uh, Josh is not going to like this, I wish we had more of a parliamentary system in the United States so that we could have co single issue coalitions amongst various parties to come together on, let's say, getting out of Iraq or Afghanistan, something like that. I wish we had the ability to have Green Party and uh, Peace and Freedom Party and Libertarian Party people in Congress. I really hate the binary R and D thing, but we don't have a parliamentary system. And with the presidency, especially, it's such a winner take all top down approach. And, and we see this in the in the pose of the candidates. No, nobody's talking about running for president to heal and represent everybody. I mean, Bloomberg sort of tries to say that, but I, they're talking about vanquishing the other side in, in revenge for daring to elect Trump over Hillary. I mean, that's really what this election is going to be about. It's going to be about revenge. It's not going to be about kumbaya. So I hope the third, I hope the Libertarian Party does well. I, I think a lot of Libertarian Party people uh, are hostile to the Mises Institute. That is both bizarre and hilarious to me. I don't really care. But nonetheless, I'm, I'm a fan of third parties generally. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not a you know, against that, I think the third parties allow for more choice and more delusion. But it's uh, uh, that that this uh, magical voting machine that you can walk into and uh, you know give someone else the right to uh, enact violence against others on your behalf, uh, a right that you don't personally have, is, is kind of uh, funny. But yeah, yeah that, that's a whole different story. But one one thing I did want to ask, you know, a big problem that I see in the libertarian side, and it, it's just funny because I, I just don't see it. I've never seen it. Is It's the attack that the mainstream has against libertarians like myself, like many of my friends, like uh, is that we're racists. And it's the furthest from the truth. I just, I, I literally, I, have, I don't care about someone's color or creed. You know, some, some cultures I find a little bit you know, crappier than others, like anyone, you know, but that's not to say I'm, I'm racist towards those uh, individually, you know, because the whole point of libertarians is to not look at groups and rather to look at the individual as a self person and, and then decide whether to do business or trade with those, those individuals. <laughs> and so I find that the whole concept funny. Where do you think this sort of racist meme came from? And how do you think that we as a, as I, I guess, a movement in a way can, can sort of, you know, remove that, that meme, this ridiculous meme? I think we have to understand that the left does have an animating impulse, and that is egalitarianism. It animates everything the left says or does, fairness, equality, and by equality, I mean equality of outcomes, not equality of opportunity, bo both of which are hopelessly impossible and anti-human and, of course, you know, result in horrific government if you actually pursue equality of, of opportunity or equality of outcome. Equality before the law 
is what we ought to pursue. So the left has an animating guidepost known as equality, egalitarianism. The right does. The only animating impulse on the right is we're not the left. Slow down, tradition, whatever. I mean, the, the right has no answer to what replaces God in Western society. The left has a ready answer, which is the state. <laughs> as a result of this, I think that anyone who accepts a negative rights view of the world, which is libertarians, which is, hey, you have the opportunity, you have the right to be left alone, but you don't have the right to stuff provided by others. If that results in an unequal distribution of stuff, then the left is going to say that's not acceptable. And the left is going to say, if that has any racial component to it, that you guys must be a bunch of racists and you must want this because it, you know, we're, we're so far beyond talking about equality in this country. Look at how, look at how black people have suffered. Look at how black people have fared, for example. And, and as a result, if you're not looking to rectify that as your number one animating issue, then you must secretly want that state of affairs to continue. And you must secretly be a racist. And that's, look, I, you know, that, that's a tough thing to overcome because you point at someone and say racist. Oh my gosh, that's the worst label ever. Nobody wants to be a racist. So it's very, very tough. And here's the thing. Here's, here's one of the big differences is the left isn't kidding. You know, when the, progressivism is not a buffet, you don't get to pick and choose from the salad bar. You're all in. If you say, well, you know, I really think that the state has hurt black people and that statism has been unfriendly towards minorities in this country and actually reduces the size and scope of the state might allow a lot of black people to come out from under the yoke, you know, they can just point at that and say, well, you know, don't you, don't you want to help black people? Don't you want reparations? Don't you want uh, affirmative action, whatever state program it might be? And so, you know, that's, I think that's the problem we face is that most people don't look at society in terms of uh, individualism. As you mentioned, most people look at society in terms of groups. And maybe that's just an inherent marketing flaw in, in libertarianism is that most people are not, are not wired to think so much in, in terms of individualism. And honestly, and this is probably a fair criticism from the left, probably fair to say, well, if you're black, it's not so easy to look at the world in terms of individual rights. We have a group identity that has been sort of imposed upon us by history, particularly in the United States. So that's, that's the challenge. And I think a lot of it just comes down to trying to be good people and say, look, let's treat everybody well. Let's treat everybody kindly and not, and not fall for this identity politics. And identity politics doesn't help anybody except for the, the, the state itself. I think that we can all agree on. Yeah. And I think there's these sort of catch, gotcha, gotcha questions where, you know, someone will ask a question in a, in a debate like, oh, well, what, what do you think about someone being able to not let a black person into their restaurant or something like that? And the libertarian will say, well, well that, that, that's fine, but he would be an idiot because then, you know, he's missing out on business. And, uh, and then, of course, everyone reacts and says, what? Racist? How can you allow that? And, and I, I kind of do see it as well. It's kind of a ridiculous thing to bring up and it's so, so weird, but it seems to be one of these sort of things that constantly gets trumped out and uh, pardon the pun there but uh, yeah it's 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 awful and I, I it's just one of these things that just keeps annoying me about the mainstream's uh, criticisms to libertarianism and freedom well libertarianism isn't progressivism and it, which means it has to be attacked it has to be vilified. That's how politics works. So we can't be such tender feet that we cry about being mischaracterized. If you want to engage in politics, that's the nature of the game. You're going to be smeared. You're going to be slandered. You're going to be called bad names. And, and look, there's a lot of arguments for not engaging in politics. Don't get me wrong. But if you're going to, you just have to accept that. I would say that, you know, people say that there's a lot of racism because of Trump, but I think that there was a lot more racial kind of division trumped up during the Obama era. What do you think would have happened? You know, the nice thing that I thought about, okay, so the Trump campaign was just horrible, right? It was just this weird morphing thing. But I was lucky to be a part of the 2012 Ron Paul campaign. And that was really a unification of people. What do you think if Ron Paul had been elected? Do you think that he would have been an effective president? You know, we see a lot of blocking of Trump's initiatives, whether that's theater or not, who knows. But do you think that Ron Paul would have been able to put anything through? Like, what would that have looked like? <laughs> wow, what a question. Well, yeah, it would have been bizarre, obviously. And, and look, the neoconservatives of both parties spent the whole 20th century trying to create the theory of the unified executive, where the president has you know, ultimate power in Congress and the Supreme Court are just these speed bumps along the road to 
the you know strong executive carrying out foreign policy unencumbered by these nitwits in Congress. And so they would deserve Ron Paul good and hard as a result, because what they've basically spent the 20th century doing is saying that foreign policy is entirely the purview of the president, which is nonsense. But if they're going to say that, then fine, let's get Ron in there and start withdrawing troops. You can A president can order troops to leave. In my view, this is a matter of constitutional law, blah, blah, blah. But in my view, a president can order troops to simply leave a zone, a war, a, an area, a foreign country and return to the United States without congressional action. That's not engaging in war. That's, that's pulling back from war. So I think Ron could have done that. We might have a bunch of, we might have 3 million troops sort of mulling around on U.S. bases, twiddling their thumbs all day. That'd be fine by me. Hey, let's just keep paying them. Anything other than harassing people in the Middle East, which is going to create enemies for centuries for our kids and grandkids. It just makes me absolutely sick to think about. So I think Ron could have done a lot. I don't think he would have gotten very far with Congress and the day-to-day machinations of things. And he, you know, in many ways, he didn't get very far with Congress when he was a member of it. But here's what we got to remember. As much of as nice as a dream as that may be, a lovely thought to think of, of gentle, sweet, peaceable Ron being the president. Look, the GOP had two chances in primary. GOP primary voters had two chances to not necessarily even to vote for Ron and to make him the nominee, but to give him a good showing in those early primaries in New Hampshire, in Iowa, and South Carolina, like Pat Buchanan got in 1992. I think he won New Hampshire, right? But but they didn't do that. Ron got one or two percent even in those early primaries. And I Rand didn't fare much better. So the idea that there's this big libertarian wing of the GOP just waiting to assert itself, I don't think that's true. And unfortunately, our progressive friends think the GOP is entirely libertarian. They think that they think uh, Republicans are enthralled to this dog eat dog laissez-faire capitalism, which is anything but the truth. But let you know, we shouldn't forget people had two chances in 08. And by people, I mean Republican primary voters in early primary states had two chances to vote for Ron, including a new Hampshire, which is supposed to be the free state, and they didn't choose to do that. So that tells you that from a a perspective of electoral politics, libertarianism is an awfully tough sell, especially national electoral politics. Do you think that we need a leader in order to bring that idea out the way that Ron Paul was able to? And do you have any ideas on what that leader would look like? Is there somebody out there that you think can actually cut through? Because things have devolved. And I mean, I think anybody serious after a while may not even pay attention to politics. So tough. A leader. You know, we like to think that ideas matter, that ideas shape the world. And they do. And of course, a lack of coherent ideology, which I would argue both parties have, shapes the world too. In other words, no ideas is a de facto form of idea, which is expediency ad hocism, call it what you want. So as libertarians, we like to be intellectual and we like to be ideological. We like to think that ideas shape the world, but really people shape the world. Ideas only have purchase through human beings. And a lot of people liked Ron personally individually. He had that aw shucks demeanor and he wasn't faking it. He wasn't testing his phrases and trying to sound really smart and brilliant. He was just saying what he thought. And I think that genuineness seeped through. There's certainly a lot of people who didn't like Ron, even within libertarian circles. Plenty of people did not like Ron. They didn't want this sort of country doctor representing what they think ought to be a cosmopolitan ideology. So let's not say that the, that he unified all libertarians because I don't think he did. But do we need a leader? Wow. Probably. I mean, that's what's so tough about this is Jacob Horberger's a nice guy, a very sweet guy, very likable. Uh, personally, he's not young. He's not female. He's not necessarily a new Coke or something. It, it's tough. I, I, I suspect the answer is yes, from a political perspective. But Tatiana, I don't know who or how or why. Yeah, it's, it's such a conundrum the with most- the... Uh- the whole leader thing, isn't it? Because you want, you want someone because there is so many different aspects of information and really you need that single sort of conduit to disperse that information. People are hardwired to listen to a leader, sadly, unfortunately. But I think Ron Paul really did that for a lot of people. I mean, the, 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 the amount of education that came out from his two runnings in for presidency, or three, I guess, uh, but the, the last two really made a huge difference. I, I definitely saw a massive gain in, in popularity of uh, in, this, in this way of thinking. Yes, 
I think that's true. There's not too many candidates out there on the stump mentioning some book you should go buy. <laughs> I mean, that's just not the way most politicians talk. And he definitely brought some fresh faces and a vitality, which is strange because he was an older guy when he ran. He's someone who peaked in his personal life after age 70. That's pretty rare. We, we're about to find out whether Bernie is going to peak well after age 70 in his personal life. So it it was interesting to hear somebody talk about ideas as though they mattered. And it was never about Ron personally or individually. So that's, that's a hard thing to capture. And he did it and he brought some new people over. Where are they now? They're scattered to the wind. And I think that's what Tatiana was alluding to earlier. What do you think of Bernie? I have a couple of follow-up questions, but I mean, since we're talking about him, I can't, believe that people actually believe in him or give him any money because he basically capitulated to Hillary stealing his rightful throne or whatever in the last election. So why would anyone continue to give him money? What do you think of the wave of ideas of people who clearly don't know about history that are interested in believing in him. What's your Bernie take? Well, I can't believe anyone's giving him money either. Just wait till he gets elected. You'll have the opportunity to send plenty of money towards him and people in Washington. I will say this. I saw a nice summary the other day of all of Bernie's pro-war votes. And people forget it's not just on the actual author authorization of military force votes. In other words, after when the, when the U.S. Congress went into Iraq and all, it's not just those votes that count. It's also the appropriations votes where you vote to fund the military in the DOD appropriations and authorization bills that come around every year. Those are annual votes. In my mind, a truly anti-war senator would have to vote no on those. To not only say I vote no on the authorization of sending troops into Iraq or Afghanistan, for example, but also vote no on the funding. Now, he's playing a little bit of a game there because everybody wants to support the troops, and we get that. And you want to say, well, they're over there. Surely we need to make sure that they have their proper equipment and funding for all the, you know, my God, the jet fuel and the tanks and the planes, and it's just endless. But mm, I don't think his vote record, his voting record as a senator is as anti-war as people like to think. So there's that. You know, on his domestic agenda, look, this is a guy who seems likable, seems sweet and genuine, I guess, from a distance, I, obviously, unless you know someone personally. But this is a guy who was almost literally a bum at one point in his life in his 20s. He lived in a commune and he didn't do a very good job. He was like the guy in your commune who doesn't wash the dishes. And then he kind of skulked around and became mayor of a small town in Vermont. I mean, this is not somebody who has had, who's done real work in his life. And that is, that's astonishing to me. People fall for it. We voted for career politicians before. We'll certainly vote for more of them. I, I will say this. You got to hand it to the left is they, they promote their ideological outliers. People like AOC, and Bernie just do fine within the confines of the, the Democratic Party. The GOP expels its outliers. People like Ron are on the fringe if they're even permitted in. So when the Republicans say, we're going to get rid of the income tax, we're going to ban abortion, we're going to abolish the Department of Ed Education, they don't mean it. They're kidding. They don't really believe it. And if they ever got control of the presidency and both both uh, houses of Congress, which they have as recently as the early 2000s, they don't do any of that. The left is much better at incrementalism. When the left says we want to tax wealth, we want to have a 70% income tax, they really do mean it. That's the difference. Now, whether they can achieve it politically is a separate matter, but they do mean it. And that's why I think you have to understand Bernie's a true believer. This is a guy who believes communism was morally correct, that it was just applied badly by the former Soviet Union. In his heart of hearts, I think that's what he truly believes, is that communism was just done wrong, but that theoretically it works. And we want to move as fast as possible, as fast as practicable politically towards full socialism or full communism. I don't think there's any doubt that he believes that. And he's potentially the nominee of one of the two biggest parties for president of the United States. So that to me is something we shouldn't gloss over with because he's kind of a kindly old guy who has a flavor of Ben and Jerry's ice cream named after him. So we're obviously staunchly anti-war, all of us on this call and a lot of our listeners. What do you think is the most important war to get out of? And that would also include, for example, the drug war or other kinds of government initiatives. Oh my gosh, it's so tough. And, and this is where I wish Tulsi 
was a little more articulate because I don't believe in this distinction between domestic and foreign policy. In other words, a lot of what the U.S. federal government does domestically is basically war on us as opposed to war on the Afghans or war on the Iraqis or whatever. So the most important war to get out of, wow, that is such a tough question because I think the drug war, I think we are slowly but surely winning the the persuasion argument. And that's not necessarily because people woke up in America one day and said, you know, those libertarians are right. You ought to be sovereign over your own body and ingest whatever substances you want, whether, you know, that's, that's not society's business. No, I don't think it's that. I think it's just that cops basically got overwhelmed with having to, every time some guy has a tiny bit of marijuana in his ashtray, you know, during a routine stop, all of a sudden that half the cop's day is gone because he's got to take this poor schlub down to the station and book him and put him in jail. And then the state, whatever state that happens to occur in has to spend all this money prosecuting him and maybe put him in jail for a month. And the whole thing became basically an unfunded mandate. So I think with the drug war, it's more a case where Atlas is shrugging and people are just waking up to the practical and pragmatic reality of this crazy war and saying, okay, you know, it really is a health thing. They're not so much accepting the libertarian line that you're sovereign over your body. So that's, that's one where we're making some progress. If I had to choose as much as I hate being in Iraq, because what we've done is we've blown the smithereens a country that in in large part the British sort of cobbled together that has three distinct groups to it and that somehow Saddam Hussein held together and they've blown it up. And now we've got a terrible situation in Iraq, but I'm more worried personally about Afghanistan because I fear that Afghanistan is going to be Korea for us. In other words, we are going to have a permit, we meaning the U.S. military, a permanent military presence there for the next 50, 60, 100 years that will just never leave, that we will end up with the equivalent of what we got in Korea, which is where we occupied the demilitarized zone. And what's so troubling and yet fascinating about that is that especially amongst younger South Koreans, they're ready for us to go. You know, South Koreans campaign on the idea of let's get rid of the Americans. Let's get, you know, let's unify at least somehow, somewhat or somehow. I mean, East and West Berlin managed to do it. So I would argue that our continued presence along the DMZ in Korea is actually delaying that potential, however remote, that potential unification that could bring Kim regime down. And so I just don't want to see us in Afghanistan forever and ever, decades with permanent military bases, which, you know, what do, you, what do the Afghans think when we go in there and start building gigantic concrete runways and permanent structures with all all kinds of military capability. What do the Iraqis think when we build this basically military base masquerading as an embassy in the green zone in Baghdad? I mean, they don't, they know what's up. They know we're not we're not using flexible temporary shelters. We're pouring concrete. They, they know that this is an occupation, that we are going to meddle in their politics forever and ever. And just because Afghanistan is so fraught historically, I mean, look what it did to the British. Look what it did to the Soviets and look what it's doing to us now. It's just it's just bleeding us out. Trump could somehow get us out of Afghanistan. I don't think he's going to. But but honestly, at this point, domestic policy is so screwed up that if, if someone, even if that was Tulsi, just made the strenuous case for pulling out of Afghanistan, that would be, man, that would be just a game changer. And I wish one of them would do it. And let's hope whoever the LP nominee is does it. Yeah, absolutely. But do you think that people have the stomach for this endless war? I mean, maybe the candidates aren't bringing it up. They're doing a pretty good job, I think, culturally promoting war and stifling any kind of an anti-war message. But that does seem to be something that's in human nature. What do you think Do you think that the American people are willing to keep funding an endless war in Afghanistan and in Iraq and maybe other places for that matter? No, they're not, but they don't see it and feel it. Look, if you go back to the early 2000s, when W was president and deep down he had a personal psychological need to prove himself as the son of George Bush Sr., who for all of his problems was a a learned and accomplished man. I I wouldn't call W either of those things. And so he came into the White House with a little bit of chip on his shoulder. He was the Fredo of the Corleone family. And so (laughs) when he had this opportunity because of 9-11 to go back into Iraq and finish what his father had started, I think that was too much for him to resist. 
And so he got a bunch of people around him like John Ashcroft and John Yu, who wrote all these nonsensical legal memos about what the president could do with and without congressional authorization. And he went in there. And if you recall the rhetoric at the time, it was all about we're fighting him over there so we don't have to fight him over here. And Iraq has had yellow cake. Iraq is Iraq sponsored the terrorists who, who attacked us on 9-11. All these things that turned out to be totally untrue. But if he had gone to the American people and said, look, we all agree, right? And the American people People were pretty hot for this war. It was, it was reasonably popular in 03. Let's not kid ourselves. If he had gone to the American people and said, look, we all agree we have to get rid of Saddam Hussein. He's an existential threat. We all agree we have to fight him over there so we don't fight him over here. We all agree that Iraq is a state sponsor of terrorism. So as a result, because we all agree and because we're all in this together, we are going to assess every household in America a $500 a month levy to prosecute this war that we all agree on. Because I'm a fiscal conservative and I believe in paying as you go and not incurring debt. Ha ha. And I don't want the Fed to basically monetize this. And, and I want every American household to prove that it's not just the troops who go over and sacrifice and suffer as our de facto mercenaries. We, we all sacrifice and suffer like people actually did by the way, during World War II, when there was rationing, you know, all kinds of privation at home to make the war happen, you know, we're all going to sacrifice. It, it, it would have been an absolute non-starter. There is no chance in hell that Americans would have said, yeah, okay, hit me up for 500 a month. I'll cut back on my cable bill or my dining out or, you know, whatever it is I spend money on because, because I'm an American and I'm a patriot and I need to do my part. Zero chance. Yeah, so that's just the, what we, the very much... What we, what we did instead was we used the Fed to pay for it. And, and because that's a little circuitous, Americans don't quite see it and feel it. So that's my long answer. Yeah, yeah the, this ending this. the Fed was a big passion for me uh, in terms of just a message. And I think that's what ended up leading me into cryptocurrency. What do you think of Bitcoin and different kinds of even digital gold representations? Do you guys think, you know, what do you think Mises would have thought of it? Well, obviously, I love Bitcoin. My thinking on it has changed quite a bit. I think early on, before I had gotten to know Saifedean, Amos, Amos, I thought that different cryptos were basically like different kinds of cars competing under a brand. So it was like, well, I like crypto, but I'm not ready to say you know, Toyota versus Honda versus Nissan is the one to choose. Now, since then, this is a personal thing, not a you know, a lot, a lot of people disagree. Since then, I've come more to to uh, Safedine's view on Bitcoin, and, and I've become less interested in so-called underlying technology and blockchain and all that. I wish Bitcoin could fulfill its original intended purpose as a really cheap, frictionless currency. I wish you could just, you know, give someone in sub-Saharan Africa a cell phone and some satellite Wi-Fi and drop some money into their account at virtually no cost, so that they could operate an entrepreneurial business, let's say, in an, in an area where banking is not readily available. So that to me was its promise, was banking for the unbanked. And of course, stateless banking outside of any uh, central bank's clutches. So it had, you know, some of its promise is perhaps not going to be fulfilled. But I think, you know, I don't know what Mises would think of it. I read something the other day, I believe it was from Stefan Kinsella. And I think this was just an off the cuff remark on Facebook or something like that, where he said, look, you can't look to books written in the 1910s to, to un help understand the digital world necessarily. It's not always a, there's not always a ready answer from 100 years ago. And I think that's true. I think that's correct. And look, as far as it being a digital currency, the U.S. dollar is a fully digital currency. When you go swipe your visa somewhere and some dollars from your account go from your account to the shopkeeper's account, there's no physical dollars anywhere. They're changing hands. You know, your bank isn't sending something over. It, this is purely just electronic lips. So we already have a digital currency. It's just run by the U.S. Treasury and the U.S. Central Bank. It's, it's, it's fully digital. There's nothing different about Bitcoin other than it's outside of that ecosystem. And that is its great promise and its great hope. You know, I think we should all rally behind Bitcoin as the best tech available to us today. And I think it is honestly better to rally behind Bitcoin than to try to tame this Federal Reserve beast. I think the Fed is irredeemable. I don't think there's any scenario under which we reel it back in to where it's sort of like Greenspan said, where it sort of tries to mimic a gold standard. 
I don't think there's any scenario under which the Fed returns to what I would consider perhaps, you know, just any kind of reasonable monetary policy, which would involve much higher interest rates and much more judicious creation of money, almost like we'd find uh, under gold. So I don't like these ideas about tinkering with the Fed or a rules-based Fed or trying to influence Fed policy. I just think we're way beyond that. And so Bitcoin is the Hail Mary that just says, screw it. They're never going to change. Let's just do let's just do an end run around them. Yeah, and this has been the problem. I mean, I think the 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 differentiator really in Bitcoin is also that it's asset based money. These are rare numbers, just like rare metals. Gold is a rare metal. We have these rare numbers, and this is a rare digital asset, which is an extremely new thing. We we haven't even really grasped what that means. And and it's funny you brought up like the underlying blockchain technology nonsense that was trumped about for so long about. You know, which was really started by people wanting to bring down Bitcoin by saying, oh, Bitcoin's crap, but, uh, but you know, blockchain's kind of interesting. And really, well, come on, anyone, how many times do you need an immutable database a day? And how many times do you need money? It's, it's, it's something that's a, it's a totally ridiculous argument. And Bitcoin, I mean, the, the promise is slowly, we went through a phase, you know, we, I run a Bitcoin physical gold exchange, we've been going for a while. And and one of the promises was cheap transactions. So we would have clients from all around the world hedging uh, Bitcoin when it was going up and buying some physical allocated gold and then selling it back for Bitcoin when it changed price. But th- that, that promise got broken in the scaling problem where people were starting to have to pay huge fees. And you know, But these, these things are all getting sorted out now. Uh, Lightning Network is coming along really quickly. We're starting to see second layer solutions where people can start. Uh, I saw an app the other day where someone could pay a lightning channel by connecting their Chase Manhattan account and could pay a lightning channel directly from their bank account. It would end up as Bitcoin instantly, already pre-confirmed by the blockchain. So, uh, you know, it was faster than anything else because it's already, uh, it's just amazing what's happening and it's happening so fast. And what I love about this revolution is that anybody can help program it. it try programming something for you know, some some you know visa or something like that it, you know some kid in in uh, uh, Myanmar can sit there and program something for the Bitcoin protocol and it'll it'll if it's good enough it'll get uh, put in there so I think it's just a, such a wonderful bring a step forward in not only anarchic philosophy libertarian philosophy but also for general freedom of transactions and freedom of uh, uh, and uh, of, of the globe. So for, for my take, I, I think this, the base of it, that it's an asset, that there's only 21 million of these things would have uh, resonated well with the old Misians. Well, sure. And the most important thing is, is your money an asset or is it a claim to an asset? And that's, that's the fundamental distinction between the two kinds of, of good money and, and bad money. So I just wish it would hurry up. I, <laughs> I, yeah. just, want this, yeah. I just want to accelerate this because I got kids and I don't think what the Fed's doing is sustainable. Yeah. And this is what it's all about, right? It's, it's about com- competing because the Fed, I, you could just never bring them down. It's a politicized nightmare. You, you, we can't even shut them down. I mean, it's going to be harder than the Brexit <laughs> to do way harder. So the, the best way is to compete against it with uh, the internet and having a native currency of the internet is, is magical. And, uh, you know, I think gold plays a big part in this game as well. And it's funny because a lot of Bitcoin is like, oh, it's the new gold. And a lot of gold bugs are like, ah, oh, Bitcoin, no, that's just, uh, you know, money made out of nowhere, just like everything else. But actually, they play really well together. And, and um, our clients uh, see that. And this is, this is always what I find very, very fascinating is that crossover between the old school, the, the, the real money, the hard money people, and the new evolution of the, these millennials that are, have grown up with the internet, that are internet natives. And, you know, when you go to, when you go to the UK, you use pounds. When you go to Euro, you, uh, Europe, you use euros. When America, American dollars. But when you go to the internet, when you're an internet citizen, when you're, when you're working on the internet, well, what are you going to use? I am paying, we are paying a lot of freelancers using Bitcoin because it's just easier. It's just better. <laughs> I had to pay someone through wire transfer and it was ridiculously hard. I got so annoyed because at the end it didn't, you know, they didn't get the right amount of money because there was all these middlemen taking bits out and then it took like five days. It was just ridiculous. So it's, I I think we're just seeing such a a lively uh, thriving world and, and 
But when I look back at all, all the stuff I've read over the years of Austrian economic theory, and, uh, I, I just glow with the fact that this is all starting to happen and nobody can stop it. And I feel that, you know, they can try to pass laws, they can try to uh, stifle it like they have in, in many countries, and it just doesn't work because the internet bypasses it. Uh, free money wants to be free and it will be. Well, I would just say beware central banks. If they start buying Bitcoin, just like they bought up a lot of gold, that's going to be a, a sign that maybe they're trying to create some sort of derivative assets off it. So uh, Caitlin Long writes about this for people familiar with her. So the, the one thing we got to be aware of is is people creating derivative products, basically it, it, uh, fractional reserve banking using Bitcoin. So that's something I keep an eye on. Absolutely. And this is something I've been working on uh, at Voltoro is, is, is transparency in exchanges. We built uh, the glass books protocol. So because transparency is what the only thing that the blockchain apart from money is useful for is transparency and being able to see not while keeping privacy, transparency and privacy working together. It's, it's, that's amazing. And, and I absolutely agree with you. In fact, David Morgan was, was one guy who, who also two years ago in a sort of uh, coming up to December, 2017 was saying in a panel at the, the gold symposium in, in uh, Perth, be wary of Bitcoin because the uh, CME is uh, jumping on board. Now they're going to start, and they could short sell this thing and we'll see it uh, them do exactly the same game they've been playing with silver and uh, and sure enough uh, we've seen it sort of play out i don't think it's totally exactly the same but we have seen a huge drop and, and, a, and a suppression and i think they that uh, large players could simply keep suppressing the price and buying this stuff and it is such a small market that it is very manipulative open to manipulation for sure and i, I totally agree with you on that one yeah, no question. Well, guys, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on and joining us. But before we let you go, I wanted to ask you, what are, in your opinion, some of the best sources of information for people interested in these topics? And maybe include among those recommendations something for the average person that might not be ready for, you know, a full-on econ book. Maybe a book is necessary, but, you know, what are some resources? You, can... <laughs> you know, yeah, and that's, that's okay. A good one. I mean, you know, if you need a book, that's okay. But what are some resources that you think are helpful? Well, as long as it's not bedtime, I like Zero Hedge. Get just got kicked off Twitter, by the way. Read read Zero Hedge in the morning along with your coffee. That'll get you going. Just don't read them at night because you might have nightmares. You know, there's so <laughs> many sources. And a lot of libertarians have understood over the years that people do a lot better with novels or movies or popular music, all kinds of ways to influence people that at which libertarians are not very good. Now, Tatiana happens to be a, a singer and a performer and entertainer, entertainer with a great voice. So she's able to sort of uh, straddle two different worlds. And there are other libertarians doing that. But for the most part, we're not winning culture. And so, you know, that plays a big role. But I'm not convinced necessarily that we're a mass movement, that this is a 51% movement at all. If you look at most human societies, a dedicated 5 or 10% can really move the needle in a direction. And I think now things are much more about execution than persuasion. And Bitcoin is kind of like Uber. You just do it and you don't wait for permission or whatever. And so, you know, look, I, I you know, the Mises Institute is viewed as a very theoretical place. And I, I understand that. Sometimes I chafe under that because people want application. They want action. You need both. There's no question you need both, but I think we're in an era where we're in post-persuasion America. People have never had more information at their fingertips, more readily available, more cheaply available. And so at this point, if you want to learn about this stuff, you can do so at very little or no cost other than a tiny bit of your time. And so now I think it's about mobilization. It's not so much about persuasion. So, you know, whatever, wherever people are out there, I don't think they need 900 page books if that's not their thing. So we, we have to just engage with the world as it is. And that is a fast changing, fast paced thing where it's all about results. And uh, that that's the key. So if, if Austrian economics can help you, then great. I think that's the key. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeff. One more time. Can you please give everybody your links where they can catch up with you and learn a little bit more about the Mises Institute? Sure. You can go to Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org and find a lifetime's worth of reading for free, all kinds of books that you can download for free or purchase at negligible cost for your e-reader or whatever. You can follow the Mises Institute on Twitter. You can follow me at Jeff Deist. It's Jeff, D like David, E-I-S-T, all one word. Jeff Deist is my Twitter handle. Just you know, sign up for our email list. And if you want to consume just a tiny amount of econ, 
know, most people might say, hey, look, every once in a while, I just want to click on an article and learn something, and that's all I want. That's all I want from the Mises Institute. That's great. And if you want to become enthralled with Austrian economics and start reading 900-page books and decide to dedicate your life to getting a PhD or something, that's great, too. We want to be here for everybody at either one of those polls and in between. Do you guys offer a PhD program? We, we, are, we have created a master's degree program. We don't offer a PhD. And honestly, 99% of people who would ask me if they should get a PhD, my strong opinion would be no. I think there's very few people who are really cut out for a life of academic work, particularly in the current job environment. Very tough. Good. Okay. So everybody go out there, get a job, be an entrepreneur, learn some Austrian economics. Thank you so much for listening to the Tatiana show. Thank you to our sponsor, eToro. Josh, do you have any final words for our audience before we sign off? Keep it free. Keep researching, keep reading, keep loving. Follow me on Twitter, Jay Shigala, J-S-C-I-G-A-L-A and uh, check out evolthorror.com. Great. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time on the TatianaShow.com and check out Proof of Love, ProofOfLoveCast.com for the softer side of crypto. Thanks. Bye. Hey there, it's time for the show. The Tatiana Show, where you make friends and talk life and crypto. We gotta think and reflect and use lots of intellect with our hearts when we work together. I know that it can be so hard out there, looking all around and saying that life ain't fair. So that is why. We will fight and stay up late at night Listening to the Tatiana Show Thank you for listening to the Tatiana Show. Please follow us on Twitter at Queen Tatiana or on Facebook and Instagram at Tatiana Moreau's Music. More episodes can be found at thetatianashow.com and make sure you leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends.